What's up, Banger fans? This is Daniel DK coming at you with another quarantine series interview live from my living room. Today we are talking to Trey Pemberton from Texas's metal band Creeping Death. They've got a record out on E1 called Wretched Illusions came out last year. You got to check it out. Today's conversation, we cover the formation of the band, getting signed to that major label, and most importantly, how we can keep the Black Lives Matter conversation moving forward. Trey, back for round two. What's up, buddy? What's good, man? You know, I just like shooting the shit, so, you know. Me too, man. I'm, I'm a professional shoot the shitter. That's what I like <laughs> to do. I'm not great at a lot of things, but one thing I like to do is talk. So when a lot of people talk about a new band, they're often referring to a group that's perhaps existed for eight to 10 years. That's just the way that the metal, the metal world works these days. But by comparison, Creeping Death is legitimately a very new band. Tell me about your origin story and, and just how young of a band you guys are. So we started in 2015. I was a drummer in a hardcore band. And we were all just a bunch of hardcore kids just wanting to play a different style of music than like hardcore. So, you know, it was like, hey, let's switch it up. Let's play some metal for our uh, hardcore friends. And it kind of took off from there. That's wild. A lot of the early stages of putting a band together, everyone always talks about soliciting demos and sending out as many copies of your album as possible to try and get signed mm -hmm. to a big label. But you guys getting signed was it was not really your oh, intention at all. Not at all. Not at all. It, it was like for fun. Like it was a hobby. At some point we released some music and I was like, oh, like, okay, people around Texas is like really liking this. Like, okay, let's like pray around the state. I felt like I only had a little bit of time because I was like, okay, I'm going to graduate college. I'm going to have to get a job. So I'm trying to do all this as much as I can. And then E1 hit us with that email and it was like, oh shit, like this is a legit opportunity to like actually do this for real. And immediately we were all like, yeah, let's do it for sure. So I yeah, deleted I my LinkedIn account and it was like, yeah, <laughs> all over for there. That's how you know it's real. Yeah, dude, the, the LinkedIn, LinkedIn account, account. Yeah. is done. You can't find me anymore. It's not just any you know, basement label that wanted to press some cassette copies or something. This is like, <laughs> yeah. this is like real deal, man. This is awesome. Major label. Yeah. And it was like, we saw the roster and it was like, whoa, there's like people who have been like nominated for Grammys and shit on here. And we were like, are you sure you want, <laughs> this is the right band? Like, are you not trying to find some Metallica cover band or something like that? Like, like we were just so confused at first, but we were really happy about it. It really does explode for you guys. Like you went mm -hmm. from playing on the floor to playing like 2,000 plus cap theaters yeah. in, in under four years. Oh yeah, it's a pretty jarring change. I mean, like even even now, it's like we play shows uh, on every scale. Like, you know, we'll play around here, Gas Monkey. It's like a 3,000 cap venue or whatever. We'll also play a place like a local hardcore venue that we always play at. We play there, it's all on the floor. It's like, we can play anywhere. And I, that's really my favorite part about it honestly would you say there was like like a learning curve in going from playing shows where like literally you're face to face with people to like having a separate front of house and monitor dude sound wise and stuff if you have a good front of house guy yo that shit is life changing bro i was like the first time that happened to me i was like whoa i was like this is how this shit's supposed to sound that's crazy definitely a learning curve especially asking for what I want in the monitors and things of that nature. Uh, the High on Fire tour really helped me with that. My friends, uh, Greg, he's a tech for High on Fire and uh, Death Heaven. He helped me out on that a lot. And then um, Zach Rippey, he was the front of house guy for Power Trip. Yeah. He, I, yeah, I love that dude. Zach's he helped the me man. Out. Yeah, he helped me out a lot too. So, and then obviously Power Trip and uh, even Matt Pike just asking for advice here and there. It's like, you learn a lot on stuff like that. And that's like, now going forward, it's like, I'm like, Bing, bang, boom. This is what I want. Like, you know. It's, it's actually really cool you bring up that point about uh, not knowing what you want at first. Like, that's a, that's a serious thing, man. It's like you have the whole world of monitor world put in front of you, and they're like, do you want your guitar? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Do, do I? Do I? Yeah. It's like, at first, I was just like, yeah, I just crank my shit. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier that you were playing drums before you played a guitar excel at one instrument like that and then pick up another and excel at that instrument the way you do it's pretty impressive do you come from a strong musical background yeah my mom uh she taught me how to play drums uh so she was a drummer she played in like kind of like hair metal bands and stuff uh in the 80s when she was like a kid and then i also uh, did percussion and drumline high school for one year uh, so i got a pretty like minimal foundation of like music and music theory 
and that helped a lot too so like i know how like i know how to read music you know little things that even though i don't maybe know every chord on guitar i just get how a guitar works because i know how a piano works you know what i'm saying uh, massively so i want to talk about texas um yes, wh where you guys are from historically it's always had an incredibly strong music scene but as of recent the metal and hardcore coming out of Texas is literally world class, dude. Frozen Soul, Mammoth Grinder, Judiciary. What is it about Texas and why does it create such badass music? I used this analogy a long time ago and I love to tell people uh, this, but it's kind of like how Australia has animals that only exist in Australia because it's like an island. So they developed differently than any other type of animal on the rest like on the rest of the planet and texas is, is like kind of like that it's like texas is so big and all the major cities are so big and the populations are so big you can tour texas and you know play you know five of the top 25 biggest cities in the entire united states and you don't have to leave your state and on top of that it's 24 hours to drive to the west coast and then it's a whole 20 20 hours to drive to the east coast and so a lot of people are just like fuck it we're just gonna play around here and then eventually it's like I, the iron sharpens iron kind of thing you play amongst your peers and amongst your friends and you obviously take influence from that and from them and all that and it just kind of makes its own thing that's true no it actually makes a lot of sense to me man from me playing in bands and countless other bands i see like some bands like you go down to texas for south by and it's so fucking removed from the rest of the country that you literally just do a texas tour it's its own scene and that's always super cool and it's cool that it uh it feeds into itself like that and it supports itself that's rad absolutely it's definitely very self-sufficient it's really cool i want to talk about wretched illusions man i know that the record came out last year but uh, people are still talking about it, and with good reason. I think that when you listen to it, you really hear the hardcore influences and the death metal influences. But there's something cool about it that where it does sound complete. It sounds like a realized sound. It doesn't just sound like a death metal band with breakdowns. How do you achieve that? There's so many different like uh, death metal influences for Creeping Death, and they're very different bands that to get them all together, uh, you kind of try to have to piece it in a way that it doesn't sound disjointed and it doesn't sound like five different bands. And um, I think a lot of where the hardcore influence comes from is definitely like live, the energy aspect. I think it's just us just trying to make it all not sound disjointed. And then in that way, it's just like you kind of mesh your own like sound. So no, dude, it's, it's, it's an awesome record. And uh, everyone who somehow hasn't heard it yet came out last year. Get, get up to date. Okay. Have you and trapped under ice exchanged band name stories yet? Uh, not yet, but uh, TUI is like literally my favorite hardcore band of all time. Like literally the band that got me into hardcore. So they're the ones who actually even gave me the confidence to like, oh, fuck it, Trapped Under Ice is a Metallica band name. Like, whatever. Because we were like, oh, should we do it? And we were like, oh, fuck it, whatever. It's not that big of a deal. Because we were just like, we're just playing to hardcore kids. No one will ever care. Ha ha. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, dude, metalheads are all freaked out by this concept. But they don't realize, like, in the hardcore scene, that is the ultimate Absolutely sign normal. of respect. Yes, the Absolutely. ultimate sign of respect, man. Absolutely. It's just respect. We're not trying to say anything. We're not. It's just like. It's a band that we all love and respect, and the song is fucking badass, and it's a cool name. So, like, like that's it's that's literally it. So, it's funny. The first time I heard your band name, people are like, "Yeah, they're called Creeping Death." I'm like, "Guarantee they were hardcore kids." That's awesome. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes, that's awesome. Yes. So, Trey, I think it would be uh, totally foolish uh, of us to not discuss uh, what is going on in the world for real right now as much as fun as it is to chum around with a pal there's way more important shit going on uh in the world as musical anthropologists at banger we like to try and view the global metal scene as an inclusive one but especially in times like these it becomes pretty apparent that that may not be the reality yeah. i'm wondering what your thoughts on that reality might be I mean, like, it's called a subculture for a reason. It's reflective of our culture at large. And our culture at large is, is a, a racist one. And it's cool that a lot of people right now are face-to-face -face and coming to terms and trying to learn and trying to understand. And, like, the getting their worldview challenged is very uh, tough for, for a lot of people. 
there's a lot of people that are going to dig their heels in. And the same thing uh, that you see all the trolls online saying all this shit, like the same, you're going to see the same thing. And, and pretty much any, any community, even, even if you do think it's like necessarily more inclusive or whatever, it is going to reflect society at large. So I'm not surprised at all. What I am happy with though, is like, especially with our fans, the people who at least care enough to, want to follow us on social media, that they at least get that we're a band full of people of color. Not just me, uh, Eric and Reese, uh, both of them, you know, Eric being Dominican, Reese being Iranian, at least Creeping Death fans seem to, to get that. And I think that that's really cool. And I'm really glad that, that, that just there's a dialogue now. If you ask any black person, any person of color, it's like, yeah, all this stuff is true. It's like, we've been screaming this for years and years, but like, you know, it's now it's very, very loud and in your face. It's uncomfortable for a lot of people, but, you know, that that's how you grow. Growth is uncomfortable. It always is, you know. I agree. And I think that I, I want to give huge props to Banger for giving me the chance to to ask some of those uncomfortable questions as a white dude to a black dude. Like there mm-hmm. is there is a lot for us to talk about that I think we should have been talking about for a long time. And I think it's really important at least from my perspective, to make sure that this isn't just a moment, that this has to be an ongoing movement and uh, a change. And I want to know, in your opinion, how do we use, transition this moment into a longstanding movement and use it as a positive catalyst for metal moving forward? Not letting the conversation die, not letting the conversation die amongst your peers, not letting the conversation die amongst your family members. You know, the, the media is going to stop talking about the protests and stuff as much. There's people in the streets everywhere still. It's still going on. So still continue this conversation with people, you know, and research and learn a lot about some of the things that are going on. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like to read. There's a lot of documentaries and stuff you can watch. You know, 13th on Netflix. That's a great one. Like people love Netflix. Watch that. Start that one. Just continue the conversation going because this, this, at me as a black person, this doesn't go away. It's like every day for me. Every so often this happens in America where, you know, an unarmed black person gets killed and everyone's up in arms for like two weeks and then this new cycle passes. To make that not happen, we have to, to do a good job of continuing the conversation um, amongst our peers and taking it upon ourselves to, to, to do the work and do the research. You know what I mean? 100%. Right now, a lot of white people asking black people, what can I do? What can I do? And I think that a big thing for me is I don't want to come off as asking you what to do because I don't think that onus is on you. I think that onus is on me to, to, to read and to educate myself. Yeah, so that's, that, I think that is one of the main things that is going to help keep the conversation going. You know, doing your own research, doing your own reading. And once you do that, pass on those readings to people who don't necessarily get it, who don't necessarily... Uh, understand and you know also i want people to not waste their time on people who are arguing in bad faith because there's a lot of people who are just going to dig their heels in and they're not trying to listen but you know there's a lot of the people that are still in the middle and the people in the middle you just gotta keep educating our entire lives are built upon a system that is completely flawed and one of the huge pieces of this very complex puzzle Admittedly, it's a very complex puzzle. One of the huge pieces, I think, is um, the police force. Perhaps people who don't understand the concept of defund the police, it sounds extreme, and it, it perhaps it's makes, them feel, yeah, it, it makes them feel uncomfortable, but um, it really isn't something that they should be afraid of. And can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think the, the problem we're having communicating this, now in 2020, uh, information is consumed one morsel at a time. Like it's got to be quick. You read the headline. You know how it is. People don't read the article. It's the flashy slogan. Like, that's it. They see abolish, defund police. It's like they can't wrap their brains around another system that works better for all communities on paper it's not stuff that's extreme there's no reason that new york city uh needs six billion dollars going to their police department when i know damn well because my dad was born and raised in brooklyn new york in the 70s and 80s i know damn well there's many schools still to this day that are completely underfunded i mean still in texas i have friends that are teachers who have to buy all of their teaching supplies but there's, there's SWAT teams that are getting millions of dollars around here. You know, they're getting tear gas, they're getting tanks. It's like ridiculous. Take the, that money, 
apply it to the community, apply it to getting people out of situations where they feel like they need to commit crime and watch, watch it flourish. Get that police for that force part out of the community and watch like crime go down. It sounds scary because people that defund the police, they've never had a life without police. They don't understand that defund the police really just means allocating that money to better systems that work for everyone. Exactly. Because people, they're like, oh, I'm, I'm, what, if, what if you need to call the police? I, I don't call the police. When, I, when, I call, when people call the police around black people, it gets worse. I remember I was in college and my car got broken into and my books got stolen. And I needed something for my class that day. And I told my professor and they came out and was like, yeah, you, you like, it's, you know, it's broken. Like, you know, okay. Like, I, I believe you. Like, you need to file a police report. I'm like, no, I'm just going to have to take the L on this. Like, there's no, there's no one saw this. Like, there's not any cameras facing this in the parking lot. Like, like I'm just going to have to take the L. And they're like, no, no, no. I'm going to call the police and the campus police and we're going to get this sorted out. They call the police and first thing they do is go, is this the guy? And pointing at me and he starts grabbing at me. And the, and the professor's like, no, 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 no. Like, no, this is his car. This is we, I called you. After that, the professor uh, finally calms this cop down and was like, then after that, he just gives me attitude the whole time. Like it was my fault. My car got broken into. And then of course, nothing happened. Nothing happened to it. Like nothing came of it. Like I never got my books back. I, you know, I, I knew I was just going to have to take the L and the professor insisted and I almost got roughed up because he thought I broke into my own car. It's not the same. We can't move the same because of our skin color. And I just think I need people to understand that, you know what I'm saying? It's not personal. It's just like I have to operate differently because of the, the way the system operates now. And I just want the system to change so we don't have to do that. That's literally all we're asking, you know? I'm a punk at heart. Growing up, it was fuck the police. Obviously, that's how most people who are into punk rock and hardcore metal view authority in general. Um, mm -hmm. But I didn't really understand this concept of white privilege and how fucking real the prejudice and racial bias. If I was in that position, I would have been treated differently by police officers than you oh, were treated. Yeah. And that is the point that needs to be made to people who still don't understand. I think that like the individual affects the community and the community affects the society and it goes on to a global scale. We need to control our scene, which is metal, which in my opinion right mm -hmm. now is a very safe place for white supremacists, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah I think definitely in certain uh, like styles, um, for sure. Like I said earlier, uh, I think it is pretty indicative of the culture at large. Um, but the fact that they can kind of hide, um, is a little bit disconcerting a little bit, you know, I get rattled just thinking about it, to be honest, their bands are popular, people wear their shirts and it, I don't know how to change that. I mean, you know, personally for me, I, I'm a very laissez-faire kind of dude. I, I would want people to be educated and I would like to think they like the art for the art, but you know, a lot of people get indoctrinated by that shit or whatever. I personally, I always tell people listen, I'm, you can listen to whatever the fuck you want, what, but I, am, I have every right to think whatever I want about you for, for listening to that. And I have every right to not fuck with you because of what X, Y, Z represents. You know what I'm saying? When people take it personally where I'm like, yeah, well, okay, well, yes. You know, well, I'm not a racist or whatever because I like X, Y, Z. I'm like, okay, cool. But I'm like, I'm not going to fuck with you. And you can't be mad that I'm not going to fuck with you. I can't be fucking with a band that doesn't fuck with my own humanity or thinks I'm lesser just because of some arbitrary bullshit I can't control like the color of my skin. If you want to rock with a band like that, yo, be my guest, but I'm not fucking with you or, or shit like that. So, you know, that's just my two cents on it. No, I agree. Sometimes just distancing yourself from those people is enough to, to maybe alienate them and help them realize that they need to be educated and they've been brainwashed. A lot of times these people just dig their heels in. And it's like, why would I fucking waste my time trying to prove, like, why I am not lesser to some fucking asshole who doesn't matter? And it's like, whatever, dude. I'm not going to fuck with that shit. I have, I have way better ways to, to spread my message and my platform and all that shit. So I don't fucking waste time with people like that. Well, dude, as, as you said earlier, this is, this is not just a moment. This is your life. And this is something that you've been dealing with and will deal with 
every day. So I just want to say and make it very clear that I, as well as Banger, are on your side in this fight. Um, and I appreciate this, it, man. This is this is not this is not a moment. This is a movement, and it it's great that it's in everyone's face right now. But it needs to continue. Absolutely, absolutely. And it, it's it's not something people need to realize. This is not something that's going to be overnight. Just keep chipping away at it, you know. Well, I think as long as the conversation remains open and remains uncomfortable as it should be, we need to, we need to face those uncomfortable demons that exist inside of people. I, I think it's important that this conversation stays open, and I appreciate you so much for having this conversation with me today. This is unlike anything we've ever done on Banger before. So, um, Absolutely, man. I'm, I'm glad, glad, to, uh, glad to be back, glad to, to chat with you about it, man. Uh, glad for you to be open-minded and, you know, just having me on and talking about this at all. It's cool, man. I, I really appreciate it. Appreciate you being with us. Can't wait for another kick-ass creeping death record whenever the fuck that's going to be. Oh, um, yeah. We're writing music right now. Of like, course you like, are. Yeah, we got like four new songs written, dude. We're, we're, we're hammering it. Hey, dude, we're, we're trying to come out of this like hot and heavy. That's awesome. Well, there's no touring right now, so keep writing. Get that record done. And uh, as always, a standing offer whenever you're in Toronto, Come hang at the Banger Studio. We'll have a good time, I promise. Hell yeah.